studying and studying, studying, I had about 60 pages of notes. <laughs> and I looked at it and I started praying. I was like, oh Lord, please help me. And I finished up at about 12.15 last night, but I was really praying, God, please help me to simplify. Help me to simplify. Please help me to simplify. And that has been, um, that has been one of my prayers uh, as, I, as I've been going through Acts a little bit. But take a quick look um, today that we're going to talk about be a Berean. And some of you are saying, what in the world are you talking about it? We'll talk about it this morning. And the passage this morning comes from Acts chapter 17, the book of Acts. A lot of us know, but perhaps not all of us. The book of Acts is the history of the new church that began almost uh, about 2,000 years ago, but it is not yet finished because you and I are writing that history today, right? And so this morning we're going to look at this part of the history, um, and it's found in verses 10 through 34. So I give you a key verse. And then you've got your Google map icon, and the two cities we're going to look at are Berea and Athens. Berea is still, uh, is still a city today, but its name is now Verea, V-E-R-I-A, and it has a population of about 66,000. So it's still there today. Of course, Athens is still a city today, and Athens is larger now than it was at the time of Paul. Um, by Paul's time, the city had lost its glory, and there were only about 25,000 people living there. Um, but now Athens has, I, I didn't check the, did I check? No, I didn't check the population. Uh, but Athens is the, uh, is the capital of Greece. And it was named after its patron goddess, of course, Athena. Okay, that makes sense. Um, the city was filled with gods and temples and idols. There were apparently about 30,000 different gods that were worshipped in Athens. That's a bunch of gods, I'm telling you. Um, and then we're going to just briefly meet two people. There's a word for you and some things to look ahead. So there's that. And then if you want to turn to the back page, uh, that's where you'll take some of your notes. This morning I'm going to move this out of the way as we, as we go into our message. Hang on just a minute. I don't know, you may have to cut some of this as we get started. Okay, here we go. So we've taken a quick look at the handout. Um, the last stop uh, for Paul and company, when we left them a few weeks ago, the last stop was Thessalonica. Remember we said Thessalonica is still a city today, now it's called Thessaloniki. And um, while Paul was in Thessalonica, there was a response to the gospel um, there was a very good response from the Greeks. There wasn't a very good response from the Jews in Thessalonica, and we'll talk about this. Uh, we'll talk about that this morning. But the Jews, very soon, that didn't follow Paul, stirred up trouble and formed a mob. I want to ask you this morning. We didn't talk about this last time. If you go back and read uh, in Acts. Uh, you'll, you'll see it, but I, my question to you this morning is this. What stirred up the crowd in Thessalonica to form the mob against Paul? Now, what they said was, these men that have turned the world upside down have come here and they're messing us up too. If you'll remember Paul in his younger life, when he was Saul, Paul himself had zealously opposed Christians, hadn't he? He had persecuted them. He had sent some to their deaths. And he was sincere, but he was misguided. Is that why these Jews are rising up against Paul? Because of the message? No. The reason they rise up against Paul is pure jealousy. Paul has more people following him than they do, and they rise up in jealousy. Jealousy is a horrible, hateful emotion that will poison our hearts and our lives if we let it get in. We see it throughout the Bible. It's the very reason for which the Jews sent Jesus to the cross. It was, it was jealousy. It wasn't, oh, we don't believe his message. It wasn't, oh, he cannot be the Messiah. It was jealousy. So many people are following them. We're going to lose our place. Jealousy is horrible anywhere it is found. It's especially horrible in the hearts and the lives of Christians. Amen? 
Amen. Um, if you'll pass a pass a handout to to uh, Alice as well. There we go. And, and scriptures, if scriptures, if she'd like. And so the crowd it rises up. There's a mob, and they immediately send Paul and company out of out of the city. So where do they go? They're here in Thessalonica, and immediately that night, that very night, they're going to send Paul to the next city on the way. Actually, it's a little bit further that way than there, but I had to make the map, and I, I'm not a great cartographer. I think that's the word for map making, um, so, but I'm doing my best. And so they send him away to Berea, and uh, they go that night. And they travel along, for those of you that are interested in history and things like that, if you're not, so sorry, bear with me, okay? So they travel down to Berea. Berea's not very far away. And they travel along something, a roadway that's called the Ignatian Way. And it was a military road that Rome had built so that its armies could travel quickly through the empire um, and quickly take care of any trouble or anything like that. And so Paul... And, and his companions would have traveled along the Ignatian Way, at least part of the way. Um, I look at Hong Kong, and Hong Kong's roads, I think, are pretty great. Um, nice highways, uh, not many potholes except in a few areas. Uh, there are potholes in my village, but, you know, not, not, on the, not on Tolo Harbor. But I want to show you a picture. There are still some remains of the Ignatian Way. Because we think of, I hope you don't think of Paul and his company just getting smoothly and going on to their next, ne de next destination. Take a look at the leftovers of the Ignatian Way. Imagine walking on that. How many of you have ever messed up shoes walking on rocks or things like that? I have. I've lost heels and things like that. Imagine walking along that in the night, in the dark. No street lamps, no whatever, maybe going by moonlight, maybe a, a, some other thing or whatever. It would have been quite difficult. Um, now, of course, they would have thought, oh, this is great. Look, here's this nice smooth way. But when you get up close and look, it would have been very, very bumpy. It would not have been easy travel. But that's the way they go. <clears throat> and they make it to Berea. Um, so as I told you before, Berea is still a city today. This is Berea, Berea today. So again, bear with me if you're not historical. But this, this gives us a little bit of flavor and color. And here's one of the synagogues still there today um, in, uh, in Berea, in Berea. So this gives us some idea. Population today about 66,000. Uh, it would have been larger at that time. So here we have some, a little bit of background and let's look and see. As soon as it was night, they sent Paul and Silas off to Berea. I love this. They're in Thessalonica and they're in the synagogue and trouble rises and so they flee Thessalonica. They make it to Berea. What's the first thing they do? Right back to the synagogue. In fact, right back to the area where they're likely to have trouble again. What a heart for God. You know, you and I, somebody looks at us crossways. I'm being persecuted. I'm being mocked. We feel that way at times. Let us learn from Paul who just kept on going. He just kept on going, truly. And so they went to the Jewish synagogue first. And then we're going to see that the Berean people are different from the Thessalonians. And let's see what it says. It says that the people of Berea were more open-minded or noble than those in Thessalonica. I used to read that and it used to bother me because I thought, what? I thought the Thessalonian church was a great church. We talked about it, right? Well, it was a great church, but look carefully at what is said. At, at, if you look at some other translations, what is, what is meant here is the Jews of Berea in the synagogue. And so that's why I've put in your notes the character of the Jews of Thessalonica, the character of the Jews of Berea. Because what we see here is they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So here's the difference between the two. And let's look at it just a little bit. What makes them of better character? What makes them more noble? And let's look at these things really, really quickly. Um, they listened eagerly. They had an open heart. They weren't gullible, because you know what? We don't want to be gullible, because if you're gullible, you'll swallow anything, right? 
and we're not supposed to just swallow anything, but we are supposed to have an open heart to the message. We're supposed to have an open heart to God. Do you have an open heart to God? To, do you have an open heart to the message of God when it, when it comes to you, when you receive it? If you do, then you're like a Berean. You're like a Berean. And they were praised for that. So they listened eagerly with an open heart. What else did they do? They searched scriptures daily. I want to ask you something this morning. Do you have a Bible? Probably all of us do. Or your Bible may be in print, or your Bible may be in electronic form. I want to ask you, what do you do with your Bible? That's a good answer. <laughs> I, I told you one time uh, about talking with a, a Christian. She considered herself a Christian and a very mature, uh, a very mature person. And I talked with her one time. Many, this is many, many years ago. Not part of Lighthouse. And she admitted that um, she kept her Bible beside her bed. How many of you keep your Bible beside your bed? Okay, that's very good, but I hope you do more than that. <laughs> because she kept it by her bed, and she confessed that she had not opened it and had not read it in three months. In three months. What do you do with your Bible? What do you do with your Bible? I read something one time about prayer, and I thought, oh, that's so good. And the, the, the question about prayer was, is prayer your spare tire or your steering wheel? That was about prayer. Isn't that great? Your spare tire, that's when you have trouble. Oh, you get it out. That's prayer. Or is it your steering wheel? It, it, it directs your life. I think the same thing could be said about the Bible as well, isn't it? Is it your spare, is it your spare tire? You have trouble? Oh God, you get your Bible and you... <laughs> kind of like going to the fortune teller and pulling sticks out, right? Yes. I sent plagues among you. <laughs> I, know, I, just, I promise, I just, I just did that. Is that how we treat our Bible? Or, we do, do, or, or does the Bible form part of our lives? Now we're kind of laughing, but I really, I promise you, I'm giving you true examples. I'm not making these up. I'm not exaggerating. I talked with somebody one time. The wife was a Christian, the husband was not. And the husband, I'm sorry to say, he was just a scoundrel. He, he really was terrible lifestyle, really terrible lifestyle. And um, some of his, as we say, some of his chickens came to roost. In other words, the lifestyle that he was living started weighing on his mind. And he started, uh, he was religious, but he didn't have a relationship with God. And he started having nightmares at night. And the wife really was, the wife really was a Christian. She had a relationship with God. And she came to me asking about it, but she was kind of laughing too because her husband was having nightmares um, several nights in a row. And so he went and he got his Bible from wherever it was. Um, it, certainly, it certainly wasn't part of his life. And he would get into bed at night and he would take the Bible before he went to sleep and he'd put it on his chest <laughs> like this. And then, he'd, and then he'd go to sleep. And he thought that the Bible would protect him from nightmares <laughs> if, he, if he did that. I promise I'm not making this up. I promise. Listen, brothers and sisters, the only way the Bible protects you from nightmares is not on your chest while you go to sleep. It is in your heart and in your mind. Amen? Amen. Amen. Oh, brothers and sisters, let the Bible be part of your life. And if you say, I want it to be, but it's so overwhelming. 66 books, so many pages. I start in the Old Testament, and it's thee and thou for crying out loud. Get a Bible you can read. Now, if you can read thee and thou just fine, that's my dad, then get a thee and thou Bible. But if thee and thou goes over your head, get a you and yours, okay? Get a translation. I, 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 somebody was talking with a Bible scholar one time, truly a Bible scholar. Um, he had translated parts of the Bible or whatever, and they said, they asked him, they said, they said, what's the best Bible translation? And he looked at him and he said, the best Bible translation is the one that you will read. So get a Bible translation and read it and read it. And if you don't know where to start, may I give you some practical advice? Here at Lighthouse, we've got Bible reading programs that can help you start where you are. 
You can start in the New Testament. If the Old Testament is overwhelming, start in the New Testament. Start with stories, but start, but start. You say, well, I tried, but I fell asleep. Well, <laughs> then read 10 verses. You, surely you can stay awake for 10 verses, right? Yes, you can. By the way, if you're falling asleep that fast, you probably need more sleep anyhow, right? <laughs> The Bible says he gives his beloved rest. Now, we're kind of laughing about some of this, but, but I'm serious. Let the Bible be part of your life. And, and let it just, you'll find what in the beginning for you is dry or hard to understand. If you will start taking it into your life, you know what I promise you will happen? You will start finding a taste for the Word of God, a hunger for the Word of God, a desire for the Word of God. I promise you, that's what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. And so these Bereans searched scriptures daily. Here was Paul preaching to them. And they were, they were like the Thessalonian Jews that were in the synagogue. Paul was preaching the same message to them. It wasn't a different message. And they began to read, but they said, okay, he's preaching this. Why, why did they search the scriptures daily? Were they looking at it to say, oh, that's not true. I don't agree with that. I don't whatever. No. Why else did they have good character? They were asking, is this teaching true? So we're hearing something. Is it right? This is what we know of Scripture. They weren't skeptical. They weren't opposed. But they wanted to know, is this true? Now, at Lighthouse, you know that when we preach the Word to you, we try to bring you the true Word of God, the whole Word of God, the balanced Word of God. Because, you know, there's some, if you're getting just one type of preaching, that's not balanced. How many of you, you have kids, how many of your kids want ice cream all the time? Flora? No? Kingsley, such a good kid. Okay, but some, okay, January says yes, they want ice cream all the time. Do you feed them ice cream all the time? No, of course not. What type of diet would ice cream do to a child? Same thing with us. If you're getting only one type of, one type of food from the, from the Word of God, it's an unhealthy, it's an unbalanced diet. And sooner or later, as a Christian, you'll get weak and sick, right? And so we try to feed you the balanced Word of God. But I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. Just listening to the balanced Word of God as we preach, that, and that's one of the reasons... For me, it truly takes so long to prepare. I, I really, I take more time now, and I've been preaching a long time now at Lighthouse. It takes me longer now than it ever used to. Why? I want to make sure that what I share, it's balanced. It fits with other scriptures. Oh, well, there's this and there's that. And I want to make sure that what I bring is the balanced Word of God, and it's what God has for us. Um, and so as we bring the balanced word, that's not enough. You need to be reading your Bibles. You need to be checking. Is this balanced? Is this true? Is this what the scripture says? Even if it comes from Pastor Renee and Pastor Jennifer, that's your responsibility. And so is this teaching true? Now, when that is how we come to the word of God, here's the result. You ready? As a result, Many Jews believed, as did many of the prominent Greek women and men. That's what happens when we come to the Word of God, as the Bereans did, with an open heart, searching scriptures. Is this true? That's what will happen. There will be a result in our lives if that's how we come to the Word of God. Amen? Amen. And so that's why I titled this, Be a Berean. Be a Berean, because if we'll come to the Word of God, whether it's written or, 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 or it's preached, if we will come to the Word of God in that way, it will produce fruit in our lives, good fruit in our lives. Amen? Amen. That was a little wimpy, but that's true nevertheless. Amen. Okay. So there Paul is and Silas, they're there and they're preaching, but what happens? Thessalonica is not very far from Berea, and soon the jealous Jews hear, hmm, Paul and Silas are in Berea, and people are turning to them, people are following them. They weren't thinking about Jesus the Messiah, they were thinking Paul. They're following Paul, and so the Jews hop on horses or whatever, um, and they headed off to Berea as well. They go there, they stir up trouble, and the believers immediately send Paul to the coast. Silas and Timothy remain behind with the Bereans. Paul is sent off, and they don't just send off Paul by himself, 
but they send him, they escort him all the way to Athens. And then they return to Berea and they, with instructions. Silas and Timothy hurry and join him in Berea. So here he is in Berea, and then they send Paul to Athens, probably by the coast, probably by boat, okay? And so Athens is down here. It's quite a long way. Um, it's about, I think I said, it's, four, about, about, it's about 430 kilometers to the south, and so they make it, um, they make it down there. So he makes it to Athens, and in this whole thing, Paul will go two more times, we're not going to read it here, but two more times in his missionary journeys in his life, Paul is going to go back to Berea and visit the Bereans. He's also going to go back to Thessalonica and visit the Christians there. But do you know what? Paul is only going to have one visit to Athens, and we're going to see why right now. And so Paul goes to Athens. He's there because travel was difficult in those days. Athens was 430 kilometers to the south. It was the center of Greek architecture, literature, and politics. And it was considered the intellectual and um, university center of the Western world at that time. Let me ask you, those of you from different, that were from different backgrounds, uh, in your country, what is considered the intellectual center or the university center in your country? Uh, UK? Oxford. Oxford. Oh, yes, Oxford, for sure. Okay, Hong Kong? And don't laugh, come on. Hong Kong University, right? Or depending on what you study, maybe Chinese University of Hong Kong, right? Okay, uh, how about Philippines? UP, UP. UP University of? Philippines, okay. U.S. Harvard. <laughs> I did not go to Harvard, <laughs> okay. Although we've, we're hearing scandal about it now. Uganda. Where? Macquarie. It's always hard for me to pronounce Macquarie, <laughs> okay. And different. Uh, uh, let's see. Any other countries here? Where, where, where? China, China. Beida, Peking University. <laughs> where I was, okay, we would say that. And, and other, uh, Canada, Canada. We've got some Canadians here. Okay, Alistair? He goes, ah. <laughs> to, oh, a little pride there. Too many to choose. <laughs> okay, okay. But in that day, Athens was, con oh, I'm sorry. Eh, Pedro. Where? Okay, okay. So all of us, uh, 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 Malaysia, New Zealand. Auckland, okay. So Yen? Malaysia. Malaysia. Ah, University of Malaysia, right? Malaya. Malaya, oh, that's right, the old word, University of Malaya. Okay, so all of these various, but for, but if I missed you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Your country's smart too. <laughs> okay, we'll keep on going. <laughs> okay. Uh, Togo, Togo, sorry. Lome. Lome, okay. And where's, oh, he's upstairs. <laughs> okay. And so, but for them, Athens was not just the center of Macedonia, it was the cultural and it was the university and the learning center of the Western world at that time. It was the center. And this is where Paul finds himself. So let's take a look. Um, Paul is there. He's waiting for them in Athens. Uh, Paul and uh, uh, Silas and Timothy and the others are going to join him. Let me ask you something. 25,000 people in Athens. Paul gave no address. He just went to Athens and he ge leaves the message. Tell them to come quickly. Have you ever thought about that before? What if you were in a city of 25,000 plus people and you said, tell them to come quickly and meet me. How are you going to find them? Where are they? I think Paul w and his character was so clearly known they knew we will have no trouble finding Paul. He will be making a name for himself and for Jesus wherever he is. We can go to the marketplace or the synagogue and we'll say we're looking for a rabbi, a traveling rabbi. His name is Paul. And 
and he's from Tarsus. Have you, do you, have you heard of him? They go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know this guy. I know this guy. And you may not have thought of that before, but that's Paul's nature and that's Paul's character. So he's supposed to be resting in Athens as he's there and he's waiting for them. But while he's waiting for them, his spirit is deeply troubled. Why is his spirit deeply troubled? The city is full of idols. Now I want to ask you something this morning. Is he a hater? You know, we live in a world these days that if you're kind of like that, people call you, oh, you're a hater. You don't like these things. You're a hater. Have you heard that before? You, some of you have, and young people may have heard it even more. You're a hater. Was Paul a hater? Was Paul a hater? No, Paul wasn't a hater. But let me ask you another question now. Most of us have become, most of us this morning have a relationship with God. Maybe all of us do. Some of you I don't know very well. And this is what I want to ask you. In a relationship with God, now that you're in a relationship with God, can you think of some things now that bother you, that trouble you, but in the past they never bothered you? It may have been language. It may be language. It may be television shows, it may be movies, it may be music, it may even be billboards or things like that. It may even be something in your own life and now it grieves you, it bothers you. Sometimes there are things that happen in church that bother me and I think, oh, I don't want, <laughs> oh. But certainly as I walk the streets, what is happening? What's going on? Are you a hater? Are you just narrow-minded? That's what a lot of people would say. Oh, you're just narrow-minded. You, you should be more, you should be more inclusive. What's happening? When you begin a relationship with God and Jesus comes to live in your life, he changes you. And things that used to not bother you at all will now bother you. Why? Because Jesus lives inside. Things that used to be part of your life, you'll think, I don't want that to be part of my life anymore. And that's what's going on as Paul walks around Athens. It's a beautiful city. It's a city of culture. It's a city of temples. It's a city of the Parthenon and the Acropolis and the Statue of Athena and all of these other, this, the, all of these great things. But what touched Paul's heart was Oh, the idols, the idols, and the idols. In fact, the word here that it says, he saw the city was full of idols, that actually means it was swamped with idols. That's what the word really implies, or that it was under idols. And so what is Paul's response? There are some people who are religious or churchgoers today who, if they were in this situation, would go out and start condemning people. You're an idol worshiper! You heathen! You're this, you're that. Is that what Paul does? Is that what Paul does? No, because they're already condemned. So may I say something to you when you come across people who are situations that are messed up and degraded and this and that? If they are, if that's how it is, they're already condemned. They're already in the dark. They're already in sadness and in brokenness. There's no need to add to it. Add something good instead. Why not bring Jesus? Why not bring Jesus? And so what does Paul do? He doesn't say, you bunch of heathens, you're going to hell. No, although they are going to hell. They are going to, what does he do instead? First of all, he goes to the synagogue. And in the synagogue, what does he do? He starts speaking about Jesus. He starts speaking about Jesus. He goes to the marketplace. And I got some pictures here. And you say, that doesn't look like any marketplace in Hong Kong. This was a Greek marketplace, okay? It doesn't look like any marketplace in the Philippines. But this was called the Agora, A-G-O-R-A. -A, and it was, the, it was the name for a marketplace. And these, this is Athens. And these are the remains of the marketplace, the Agora, in Paul's time. So what you see here, Paul, to me it's pretty exciting. You say, oh, you're doing a lot of history this morning, Pastor Jen. I, I think it's pretty interesting. It helps us to see what was going on. Paul himself would have walked. He might have sat on some of these stones. 
he would have perhaps here, he would have raised his voice and he would have said, I want to tell you about Jesus and the resurrection. What does Jesus mean? The word Jesus means Savior or Deliverer. In the Old Testament, it's Joshua, but he would have used the word Jesus. And that's good news because people need saving. That's good news because people need delivering. Some of you have heard the word Jesus and you've heard the message of Jesus. It's good news. And he saves us and he delivers us. And you can imagine, Paul's voice was raised here as he, pro as, as he talked about Jesus. Along this area, they would have been selling fish. They would have been selling vegetables. They would have been selling clothing. But the greatest commodity, the greatest commodity of the marketplace was not fish and vegetables. The greatest commodity of the, of the marketplace of Athens was ideas. It was ideas. That's where the philosophers sat. And they sat, you can't see all of it, but take a, here's, here's one example. I think this one perhaps has been rebuilt. But here you see another example. See these? At one time, these would have been columns that would have gone up, and it would have been a colonnade. And the philosophers would sit down there, and they'd talk all about ideas. And they'd talk about Plato. And they'd talk about Aristotle. And they'd speculate about this. And they'd, what about that? And oh, they would have lengthy discussions. And you say, oh, Pastor Jennifer, you're making that up. No, I'm not. Let's see what the Bible says. And so Paul is in the marketplace. And the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, by the way, this is what I got bogged down in. I was going to present. Now, the Epicureans believe this. And the Stoics believe this. I'm not going to get into all of that, but what I'm going to tell you is they believe things that don't lead us very far. The Epicureans loved luxury and life and pleasure and the best foods because tomorrow we die. That's where that expression came from. Eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. That's what the Epicureans said. You know what the Stoics said? Doesn't, doesn't that sound like what a lot of people are doing today? Yes. Sure does. Sure does. You know what the Stoics said? This is in a nutshell. I won't give you the 50 pages. There's much, much more. And some of you are way smarter than I am. You know more about this than I do. The basic Stoic philosophy was um, our lives are fate. We can't do anything about it. This is the way it is. And the best thing we can do is just to accept it and just live the best you can. And when you can't accept it anymore and live in a good way, just commit suicide. And that's okay. <laughs> that's acceptable. You're laughing. I'm serious. Now, I'm, I'm simplifying, but that's what it was, really, that's really. Now, this acceptance, this stoic just saying, okay, I have to accept it, does that sound like anything? If you have a background in Buddhism, that sounds a lot like Buddhism, doesn't it? You just, you, you just accept, and it sounds a lot like some of the things in Islam as well. There's part of that as well, and you just accept. So when Paul gets up, and he starts preaching about Jesus and the re resurrection, it stirs the pot with these, with these philosophers. What does this babbler wish to say? Oh, now when they said babbler, have you ever been offended when you tried to share Jesus with somebody and they mocked you or they laughed at you? We get our feelings hurt, don't we? Because we're human and we're people. They mocked Paul, and Paul was not a stupid guy. Paul was highly educated. But when they said babbler, do you know what that word means? That that word means a seed picker, like a little sparrow picking up seeds. And what it meant was, oh, he's some pseudo-intellectual, and he goes around picking up ideas from everybody else, but he doesn't have his own ideas. That's what it really meant. It was very insulting, and it was very mocking. But I am so encouraged. I'm learning a lot from Paul as we're studying him. Because sometimes when people laugh at me or make fun of me, I get offended. Because I don't want to be laughed at. Do you like being laughed at? No. Me either. But you know what Paul does? He just keeps on going. He doesn't get personally offended. Why? It's not about him. It's about Jesus. It's about it truly. Amen. Amen. And so he keeps on going. And he says, oh, he's preaching Jesus and the resurrection. They were so mixed up and they had heard nothing about Jesus that when it says Jesus and the resurrection... This word is anastasis. We sing a song here at Lighthouse called Anastasis, don't we? What is the song? 
O oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. O oh, praise his name forevermore. That song, is, the name of it is, is Anastasis. But do you know what they thought? They thought, well, here's this Jesus person and some female goddess named Anastasis. Named, they thought resurrection was a female god. Which sounds kind of funny, but I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about something that happened many years ago when I was, I still have time, great, when I was in China, and when I was teaching at Peking University, and the Lord brought this back to mind because Athens was this center of learning. Sister Betty and I were teaching a, a scientist in nuclear fusion, cold, cold fusion, or, or, or I don't remember all the details now. Dr. Lee was her name. Incredibly intelligent, incredibly educated. And she was in one of our classes. This was way back, this was in the 80s in, in China. And I remember Sister Betty talked to her about Jesus. Do you know what question she asked when Betty talked with her about Jesus? She looked at Betty. It was, this was after June 4th, 1989, and we had gone back to the school, and Betty was sharing about Jesus with her. And Dr. Lee, that was her name, looked at Betty, and she said, Jesus? What is Jesus? She didn't know that Jesus was a person. She didn't know anything. She had never heard the word Jesus before. And she thought Jesus was an it, was an it. There are still places like that. There are still people like that today. And so they say, what is this guy saying? And so then, what happens next? So they took him to the high council, the Areopagus, or those of you that watched Wonder Woman. Did some of you see Wonder Woman? Okay, what is the name of the god of war in Wonder Woman? Stephen says, I don't know. <laughs> I don't get into those things. His name was Ares, the god of war. Okay, so Areopagus, there's that first part of the word, and it's the hill of the god of the war, a oh, god of war, Areopagus. And so they took him there because that's where the council met. And they said, hey, come and tell us about this teaching. It sounds strange, and we want to know what these ideas mean. Now, look with me at verse 21. Ready? Because you said, some of you said, hey, I don't know about that. Okay, look at, look at what, what it says. It says it should be explained that all the Athenians, as well as the foreigners of Athens, seem to spend all their time telling or hearing something new. That's why the hot commodity of the marketplace was ideas. It was chit chat. It was chica chica. It was, those of you that say what? That, that's, that's a Tagalog word. It was talk. It was, it was this and that, throwing around ideas. And I want to say something as we look at this. There are plenty of people around religion and around Christianity today that are happy to talk, talk, talk. But may I say something to you this morning? Talk is not enough. There has to be action. There has to be action. Or else we're just like the Athenians. And all, oh, let's talk. Here's this guy, Paul. He's telling us something new. Now, we're going to get into the meat of it. It's taken us a little while to get there. But let's see what, what, so they bring him there. And so Paul stands before the council. And this is what he says. Men of Athens. Please don't say, well, he is, he is a, uh, he's a misogynist. What about the women of Athens? I'm so sorry, the council was made up of men. So he says, men of Athens, okay? And he says, men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. Now, why have I got this strange picture here? I've got it here because this is the Areopagus. This is Mars Hill. And this is where Paul would have stood. There would have been rough seats that were cut, and you can still see some of it today. This is Mars Hill. And he says, men of Athens, I notice you're very religious in every way. You're religious in every way. We're going to talk about that. Um, what was right behind, here's Athens down below. But when Paul says, I notice you're very religious, what I want you to see is, here's Mars Hill. 
here's the Areopagus. What's right behind the Areopagus? I don't know if any of you have ever been to Greece before, but right behind the Areopagus, looming over Paul and the council, was this great outcropping, this rocky mount that is called the Acropolis. And this is the Parthenon. And here are temples. And in the middle of the Parthenon was the great statue of the goddess Athena, who was the patron goddess of this city. So this is there behind him. And Paul says, I notice you're very religious in every way. May I say something to you? And by the way, I, I said it at the beginning. They worshipped over 30,000 different gods in Athens at that time. That's pretty religious, isn't it? These days, before we say, oh, those pagan and heathen Athenians, I, I don't want to just look at the back, uh, look at past. I wanted to apply it to us because you know what? Today, people still talk this way. But instead of saying religious, do you know what people say today? They say, I'm spiritual. Have you ever heard that before? And I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. This week as I was preparing, um, and people, people will, will say that, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. In other words, you know, not just Jesus and church, I'm spiritual things. This week, as I was preparing, I read a magazine article. Let me, let me read part of it to you, and I'm not just trying to pick on somebody. Um, you know, there's a show from the U.S., I'm so sorry to say, and it all begins with K, and all the family is K, 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 you know? Keeping up with the Kardashians. But what I want to read to you is this. Listen to this. Kim and Chloe pay a visit to, I don't know how to pronounce it, but Mas Joko or Mas Hoko, a renowned local healer during the family's trip to Bali. Kim, uh, Chloe explained, Mas Joko has come so highly recommended. People from the U.S. fly to Bali to see this man. And Kim added, I love connecting with the spirit world. I believe in everything. Isn't that, at first I laughed at the ridiculousness and then I was so sad because this describes, I don't know about your country, but this pretty much describes America today. Well, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. I believe in everything. That's like the Athenians. That's like the Athenians. And Paul says, but he won't leave it there. And I, I bring this up to you because you know what? As time goes on, you're going to hear this more and more. And you're going to see it more and more. And you've got to be ready to talk about it. And not just say, ah! But you've got to give a response. And Paul says, you're religious. As I walked around and I looked carefully at your objects, I found an altar. By the way, this was not the altar that Paul saw, but this is an altar to the unknown God that was found in Rome. And Rome says, I found an, uh, and Paul says, I found an altar to the unknown <coughs> God. Now, the one that you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. Oh, that gives me chill bumps when I read that. It really does. You know what had happened 600 years earlier? There had been a plague in Athens, and it was killing people. And they didn't know what to do. And they went to all of their gods and they sacrificed. And they went to all their gods and they burned incense. And they went to all their gods and they killed sheep and they killed goats. And the plague continued. They said, what shall we do? What shall we do? And a passing wise man, holy man, said, oh, you have offended an unknown god. So what you must do is turn sheep loose in the city. And if the sheep lies down someplace and it's not near a temple, then mark the spot, build an altar to the unknown God, and then sacrifice that sheep there. And so they did this all over Athens. And this was the altar that Paul saw to the unknown God. May I say to you this morning, brothers and sisters, that there are people still worshiping the unknown God. I've told you before the story in Singapore, but this is mom's story. Um, a woman started many, many years ago. She came to the church and became a Christian immediately and accepted Jesus. And one Sunday evening, she gave her testimony. And they said, well, how did you come to Faith Assembly? That was the church. How did you come here? Did a friend tell you? And she said, no. 
She said, I used to go to the temples. And you know, at that time, oh, Singapore was full of idols, full of temples. Not so much now, but at that time in the 50s, full of temples, full of idols, full of gods, the monkey god the patron god of, of Singapore, the, mon the monkey god. And she said, I, went, I would go to the temple and I would work every day and I would bow down and I'd, and I'd give incense and I'd worship all of the gods. And she said, finally, one day, I looked at all of the, I she didn't call it an idol, I looked at all the gods and I looked at them and I thought, they can't all be true. They can't all be real. There must be one that's true and real. And so she stopped and she prayed and she said, God, the one true God, if you will tell me who you are, if you will show me who you are, I will follow you, I will worship you, I will give you my life, and I will stop following and worshiping and giving my life to all these other gods, but you alone. And then she went home. That night, she was asleep in her bedroom. And you say, oh, is this really true? It's really true. It's not a made-up story. I promise you. And that night, she had a dream. And a man in white stood beside her bed and said, if you will go to this address, they will tell you about the one true God. And she got up the next morning and she went to that address. And that address was the address of the church. And she found out about the one true God. It's time to stop, but what I want to say is this. We're going to pick this up when we come back to this because there's so much here that's so good. A little bit later when Paul preaches, he's going to say, and I'm going to, I'm going to skip through, but we're going to come back to this. He says, I'm going to, sorry. You, you're wondering what that picture is. I'm going to tell you next time. He says, He has put us on this earth, all of us, so that they and so that we might seek God and reach out and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. He's not far from each one of us. He's not far from you. Some of you found God here at Lighthouse. Do you think you came here by accident? You didn't come here by accident. God brought you. Why? He's not far from you. And he wants you to know him. Look at what else it says right there as we, as we close this morning. We'll come back to this. He is not far from each one of us. And he wants us to reach out and find him. There's the purpose of your life. That's why God put you here. And you say, oh, pastor, don't be so narrow. I have many other purposes in my life. I know you do. I have many other interests in my life. So do I. But what Paul is saying from God is this. God made us. God put us here. God made you as you are. God made you with the interests and the abilities that you have and you've done something with them. But your highest purpose, your highest meaning is found first in knowing God, in having a relationship with Him. And when you do, everything else will fall into place. All of these other parts of your life, and you think, well, I'm interested in this. I'm interested in that. I want to do this and I want to do that. How can I make it all work? How can, how can my life work out in the way that I want? Start a relationship with God. And then the highest purpose in your life is met. And then God will fulfill everything else in your life. And then the interests that you have. You might be a good business person. You think, you think God is, doesn't care about business? You don't think that God can make you a better business person? Of course He can. You're interested in, 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 in something else, or you're interested in commerce, or you're interested in trade, or you're interested in architecture, or you're interested in art, or teaching, or, or, or whatever. In any one of these ways, give it to God. Give your life to God and see what He will do with it when you reach the highest purpose for which you have been put on earth. That's what Paul is telling this group of Athenians. And we fill our lives with so many other things, don't we? 
And that's why all of these other things don't satisfy, because they're not our highest purpose. But God is not far from each one of us. And so we're going to pray this morning. We're just going to come to a close. And I'm going to ask you just to talk to the Lord this morning as I pray for you. There's much more here. and We'll come back to it next time because his, his sermon and his message to the Athenians is really a great message for each one of us this morning. Lord, we come to you this morning. And God, we thank you that you included this in the Bible. Lord, we thank you that this message that Paul gives these Athenians, they're so smart, they're so good at business, they're so educated, their lives are so full of so many things, but you were an unknown God to them. But Paul came and told them about Jesus. Lord, just as we have learned about Jesus, just as we have found out you're not far away from us, just as we have found out, there's a purpose for our lives. Our lives aren't aimless, that we live here a few years on this earth and then we're gone and that's it. But oh God, in your great love for us, because you made us in your image and because you set your love upon us, there is a purpose for our lives. There is meaning for our lives. There is direction for our lives. And you gave us Jesus, that we might know you, not far away, but Jesus who came to, uh, to us. We don't have to go off searching for you. You came to us in Jesus. And we're so grateful and we're so thankful that you have done that, that you are not far from us, that you love us, that you give us meaning and purpose. Thank you, Lord. Renew our hearts in you. May our hearts be soft before you. Lord, just as Paul was grieved by all those idols he saw, Lord, if our hearts have grown hard or calloused at some things, would you renew our hearts and give us soft hearts again, hearts like yours of love, not, hate, not hating, but Lord, hearts of love for you and for others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. amen. God